Welcome to Wisdom for Life, where we sift through philosophy to find practical advice that you can use in your everyday life. Hi, I'm Dan Hayes, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Greg Sadler. Today, we are talking about... Lying. Is it ever okay to lie? And if so, why is it? And why do we think that lying is a bad thing? And so this is one that, that I think all of us can relate to in one way or another, because if there's anybody out there who hasn't actually ever told a lie sometime in their life, at least they've been lied to at, at some point in time. But I'm willing to bet that everybody listening has at least told one lie at some point to somebody in their life. I know I've told plenty myself. You're saying that people lie? <gasps> All the time. Oh, no. As a matter of fact, they lie about lying. Ah. They, they, they tell more lies to, to cover those up. And we were just talking a little bit before the show began about a story that I was planning on telling, and that might be a funny one to begin with. When when I was in high school, I had a really good good friend who was a you know overall a decent guy, but he... He had two big problems, um, both of which reinforced each other. One was that he liked to have more than one girlfriend at a time, and he didn't like these girlfriends to know that he was engaging in this. So that was the one big thing. He'd cheat on one girl with another girl and then sometimes have three uh, uh, that he was trying to juggle at the same time. But here's where it comes to our topic. He would, of course, lie to all of them. And at first, we, we were watching him and we were like, what's wrong with this guy? Doesn't he realize that this is going to blow up in his face? Because he would tell these lies and over time they would, they would start to get weirder and weirder and wilder. And eventually the girls would figure out and they would start comparing stories because he always picked people who knew each other as well, which was really foolish on his part. Then once they compared the stories, um, they would, you know, come to him and start asking him pointed questions. And then it would all fall apart because he forgot which lies he told to which person. (laughs) And so this this cycle repeated itself several times. The first time that it happened, we thought, oh, he's learned his lesson and, you know, he won't do this anymore. Nope. He went right back to it and uh, just it kept repeating this. And, and after a while, at first we, we tried to talk to him and say, this is not a good thing to do. And then we realized that it was somehow part of his character or his his mindset and he wasn't going to change. And then we just kind of sit back and and watch this stuff happening. And every once in a while, throw something in there to stir the pot a little bit. Oh, that that slow motion train wreck. Exactly. Yeah. Well, there would there would be a a fast motion part of it once once somebody confronted him. uh Yeah. I wonder if he was more attracted to the women or the the experience of, of juggling, of and deception, lying all the maybe. time. Yeah, you know uh, I, that's a good question. I I don't actually know. He, I mean, he's been gone for a very long time. He unfortunately died young uh, in, in a car crash, so he might have grown out of it at some point. Um, yeah. You know, we know that that as as we get older, our impulse control parts of our brain start to you know finally be working at full steam around what twenty five, twenty six, and he yeah. was he was only twenty two. Um, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, there's there's something that I think some people find, um, if not necessarily thrilling, at least enticing about about telling lies. Yeah, I, I know there's a certain amount of like power that you can derive over someone by kind of messing with their perception of reality. That's true. And and one variety of lying or deception would be like, uh, that's gotten a lot of discussion lately is uh, um, gaslighting, right? Mm-hmm. Where you're telling the other person that don't believe your lying eyes. Um, mm-hmm. Here's, here's the, the real story. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, I think about, like, for example, my mom uh, also, you know, long passed away. We used to joke around that she could never tell the same story twice, meaning that she could never tell something that was entirely accurate and then tell something that mapped onto that exactly uh, the next time that she told us. She always had to add something or subtract something or change something. And that bothered us quite a bit as kids because we viewed that as, as just lying. Um, I kind of think that looking back on it and reflecting on it, she did that in order to make the stories more um, enjoyable or interesting. Mm-hmm. And there's other people in my family who that, that I think that trait um, 
can also be attributed to as well. <laughs> what's, I mean, what's your family like on, on this sort of thing? Um, for the most part, you know, there's not a whole lot of, you know, tall tales or fish stories. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or straight shooters. <laughs> um, let's see my mother's side more so you know, okay a, a good uh german background there i don't know there seems to be some cultural connection there uh who knows um and uh, i guess yeah i guess my dad's side might have a little bit you know i guess my dad would like to tell a lark but it was never told in a way where at least at the end you expected it to actually be true it was definitely oh interesting. Oh, oh i got one over on you, you, did, you didn't you realize that this was totally insane and that you should not have been like going along with this in the first place yeah yeah now is that a lie that's all we should think about well what yeah. what is a lie right yeah so, so we, oh go ahead we've got a couple of views and there's you know you're either you're on um, an expansive view or a more limited view, and the expansive view is that any untruth is a lie. Um, so this is regardless of if you think it's true or not. So, you know, you believe the car that drove by was green, but it was actually yellow, but you just misremembered. And you believe it's green, so, uh, but it was yellow. Um, yeah. Many people would call that not a lie, but there's an expansive view that that would be a lie. And then the limited is a... Um, to make a believed false statement to another person with the intention that the other person believe that statement to be true. So this is, you know, it's false. You ex- and you convey it, making the other person think that it's true while you are expressly knowing that it's false. So that raises a lot of interesting limit cases where we might think about in fiction, for example, right? Mm-hmm. Um, if fiction, or if we think about like uh, media production, like movies and TV shows, if if it's really effective, we we do in some sense think that it's true, at least while we're watching the movie or reading the, the novel, mm-hmm. because we allow ourselves to be affected by it as if it were true. And <clears throat> at the same time, we can we can we can withdraw from it. We're not we're not stuck in it, right? Mm-hmm. Um, maybe that's the maybe that's the important distinction. If I want to, if I'm watching a horror movie, for example, a great example of this is the uh, the American version of um, The Grudge. That's a really scary one, <clears throat> in part because of those scenes where the the girl comes out of the TV. Because that that kind of implies that maybe she could be also coming out of your TV. (laughs) Now, of course, the rest of the technology is very dated. You know, I think it was a was it a VCR or yeah, it was was VHS tape and a a tube TV. Yeah, so nobody nobody's going to be using that anymore. But um, the basic idea of it being something scary and we're we're watching it, but it's 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 essentially lying to us, telling Mm -hmm. us things that are untrue and deliberately so so that we can enjoy it um but we're able to go ahead it reminds me of the blair witch project which also blurs the line even more because the entire thing was the it was marketed as this was true footage found and they didn't break that lie through um you know years after the original film was uh, put out but we can still turn off the the TV or streaming or whatever it is, if we want to, we can withdraw mm-hmm. outside of that. Whereas maybe the deception thing is, is more about um, the unavoidability of buying into it. You know, so if I tell you that, um, you know, something about COVID-19 that, that you can get it, I don't know, through looking at somebody else who's got COVID-19, uh, which is clearly false. Um, now you can choose not to listen to me and say, well, that guy's full of it. Mm-hmm. But if you do, in fact, view me as, as, um, somebody who's, who's generally truthful, then I can deceive you. And then you're stuck with the consequences of being deceived. Like you're going around covering your eyes every time you see somebody who might be sick. And like a more real world experience of this was the AIDS crisis and the lies oh, that were told yeah. about who could actually uh, contract that and like how right. how contagious it was which it isn't very yeah yeah that is actually a great example 
Um, and we can think of all sorts of lies that, that people tell each other. But coming back to this like expansive versus limited view, so where do you fall in on, on this? Are you more on the expansive side, saying, "Well, if it's fa- if it's false, it's a lie," mm-hmm. you know, or or do you think it matters what the person's motives are? And and you know? I, I, I'm I'm a limited view in what I call a lie. It doesn't mean that untruths are any the the outcomes might be worse with the untruth though okay like, it, it doesn't doesn't make the other one better it just it changes maybe the way that you react to the person that's doing it and yeah what one the lie i would uh feel negatively about that person it would change my view about them because they are intentionally acting against me whereas the one who tells an untruth either they need help to a uh, try to reconfigure their way of their epistemology or how they know what is true. Yeah. Um, and and so it's a much more like, oh, let me help you versus, oh, get away from me. You're doing something negative towards me. You know, I remember when I was a kid, I think I had a more expansive view of lies because I remember um, going to movies in particular and being very upset at what I perceived to be lies. So a great example of this would be we went to see <clears throat> Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and we saw it in the theater. And I, I, I don't remember how, what age I was, but I, I knew something about the thuggies and the Kali sect, and I was like, that's wrong. You know, we went out of the theater, and everyone else was like, this is a great movie. And I was like, they're, and I didn't say they're telling lies, but I said something like that, you know. And there were other, like uh, Clash of the Titans is another great example. So I was I was quite bothered by the distortions of Greek mythology, which which is a bunch of lies too anyway, right? right. Even even the ancient Greeks often talked about, about those stories being a pack of lies themselves <laughs> and and i was i was very upset about the fact that somebody was um blending together different uh characters and motifs <laughs> you know? yeah. so, so I, it, I think there are quite a few people who do have an expansive view of oh of lying. yeah i've i've had yes <laughs> had to deal with people like that and it's it's actually really difficult because everything is bad uh, yeah, all the time, basically, and there's there's very little the um, gray area, uh, in a in a when you have a, a purely expansive view, it's like everything is bad, and because, and you because should, everything has some untruth to it, right? Um, and and also <clears throat> everyone is deserving of the same amount of punishment for saying something that is untrue versus that of lying. So this is a good segue into talking about another distinction that that gets made in terms of motives, the reasons why people lie. And I think we've all heard of white lies and then, you know, corresponding to that would be black lies. So, you know, good and white lies are usually viewed as lies that if they're not just, if they're not actually good, they're at least not bad. You know, we we tell people things that save their feelings. Like if somebody says, hey, how was my my talk that I gave? And, you know, you could say to them, "Ooh, not good at all. I mean, you did not communicate effectively the audience. You lost them at, you know, the five minute mark. Um, but, you know, unless unless you they're going to help improve their performance, what good does that do? You're just hurting their feelings. So maybe you tell them something like, you know, um, it was pretty good. You know, you don't say, "Oh, it's the best thing I ever saw," but you know, you 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 spare people's feelings, right? Um, or, or we have all sorts of little lies that we tell to sort of like, you might say, fill in the gaps in in stories, or or you know, lubricate the social machine so that we can not come into conflict with each other. Um, you don't actually like hanging out with this person, but you have to at work, and so you you lie and you say that they're, you know, they're an interesting person to talk to. Um, now, a lot, so, you know, with the expansive view, that would just be terrible, right? Because mm-hmm. it's it's still a lie. But a lot of people think that that white lies are just fine. It's it's black lies that they have a problem with when somebody lies for selfish reasons, um, and it could be about you. Th- you mentioned power earlier. Lies are one way to get po- power over people, right? You control the the um, information 
Um, but it could also be to make yourself look good or to gain some sort of monetary advantage over somebody or, or, or to, it could just go ahead. To hurt someone just yeah, because you want yeah. to, to be uh, that malicious. And so we've got this distinction here that you got down as the you know, white lies are the for you lies for other people and the, the black lies are you know, for me lies. Yeah. Now, recently, people have started talking about a third kind of lie. And I think this is actually quite helpful as a distinction. They call them blue lies. And I'm almost tempted to say blue lies matter. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I think in part, the, the notion of blue did, in fact, come from the fact that police will sometimes lie to protect other police. It's, mm-hmm. it's uh, quite a problem at, at, at some points. And a, so a blue lie has to do with... Um, Lying for the benefit of your your group, your community, your maybe your family or your profession or um, the other people that you identify with, and you know, sports teams kind of do this too, right? They they try to deceive each other oh. about what they're going to do. Oh, I was going to say like, uh, as a fan, you're like, oh, the ref is totally blind, even though that was a fair call. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you'll try to make your case that like you know, it should have been totally reversed, even though that's you know maybe not as objective as you could be. You know, the, so we'll take a little detour here in talking about sports fans because um, I think you're completely right about that. But I also think that sports fans also lie routinely about how bad their team and its players are. You know, they'll say that they're they're not playing up to potential and they spent too much money on this person here. And, you know, mm-hmm. they have all sorts of Monday morning quarterbacking for football or whatever the equivalent is for baseball or, you know, mm-hmm. things things like that. So I think the lying can be both like in favor of your team, but there's also a kind of lying with it, with an in group about like how bad your team is. And and, you know, we, we see this, too, with people razzing each other. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, you you say things to people in your in group that would not be appropriate to people outside of it, mm-hmm. um, and and a lot Although of times those is, are lies. <laughs> and and some and that's also very dependent upon the group and the norms within that group, because there are certain groups that that is totally normal, and there are some other groups that would be you know totally beyond <laughs> the pale. Have you ever made the mistake of thinking you're in one of those groups and then finding that you're in the other? On <laughs> um, I guess I tend to be the one that's not razzing and okay. so i don't usually fall into the that particular faux pas i've made that mistake before <laughs> <myself>. <laughs> yeah. um but as any going back to blue lies so um they're they're told in order to benefit those that you you identify with and they're usually um in some way directed against people who aren't in your your group they they it might be just a sort of generic way like you're favoring your group over other people but it could be like saying things that are you know false about your group to the detriment of of another group of people or you could be you just telling lies about other groups or communities uh in order to benefit your own so So, oh go ahead for example this is like are spies and like we we hail the people that work for the CAA as heroes that they fall when the line of duty they get they're like a, a star up at Langley um, and uh, we have a long history but these people are inherently lying all the time in our benefit as a nation group if you will and uh, that is a really interesting one because when other when other groups do it then we don't have that same sort of sanguine attitude towards it we're like those dirty you know deceptive spies uh they're coming in and corrupting our our wonderful truthful country you know or we don't like when their lying spies go after our lying spies you know right one of the interesting things about this is not only is it like it's post pro social within the group and it's antisocial mm-hmm. for those people outside of the group. Um, but you can say, like you said to yourself earlier, like lies within the group. Um, but those lies uh, actually create more cohesion within the group because it gives something that we all hold that no one else holds. And you can turn it into a group dynamic of, like, us versus them. And it's like, we hold this thing to be truth. And everyone else is like, what, are you crazy? Yeah. That's that's quite quite true. So 
where do where should we stand? I mean, black lives we can agree those are bad. Mm-hmm. We shouldn't we shouldn't engage in those. We should condemn them. You know, we should try to uncover them. Um, what about white lies? What about what about blue lies? What do you think? So if you go about last week and our circles concerned, if you're cosmopolitan, mm. then the the blue lies are out because okay. the idea is that you should be caring about everyone and not just individual groups. Um, I guess. I fall more towards that. And then white lies. Um, you know what? Uh, I guess I I would constrain the amount of white lies that I would do to a very small group and not just like saving one's feelings. But I think that, you know, if you, you have to kind of whittle it down close to that of um, your, uh, what is it? Helen Keller situation. You know, someone comes and knocks on the door and they're going to want to murder someone. They say, if they're, are they there? Then I'm like, yeah, why then? Okay. Yeah. So lies to protect important values, you could say. So maybe, maybe, um, saving face or sparing feelings isn't as important of a value, except maybe in certain cases, like, you know, you see somebody who's like totally devastated and one you know engaging in one more harsh truth would like break them maybe mm. maybe then you tell tell the white lie right yeah i guess for for a lot of the white lies uh it's it's kind of that difference between uh volunteering the the comment or not and i guess i would more just like not <laughs> volunteer the the positive comment yeah than then say you know, something lying. there's 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 a great thing that i guess could be considered a white lie in some respect although it was self-serving uh it's a famous story about athanasius um this this uh orthodox you know monk divine uh, bishop and when the 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 non-orthodox arians dominated um the eastern roman empire and they were seeking they're were, they're were trying to find him he, he was on the, the river and they're trying to find him because they were going to kill him and um he's going up the river and <laughs> there's a boatload of soldiers coming down i think from alexandria and they they shout out to him and they say um is uh have have you seen or is uh, athanasius nearby and he tells them you're you're not far now from him <laughs> keeps on <laughs> sailing no he deceived them right so there there was an intent to deceive by saying that he didn't explicitly lie he didn't say anything that was actually untrue as a matter of fact he said something that was quite clearly true mm-hmm. but he said it in such a way as to mislead them mm-hmm. Is it a lie, and is that a white lie? What do you think? It it's definitely a lie, at least on the okay. uh, constrained, narrow thing, because the intent is to mislead them. <laughs> um, and is it w- white? I don't know. It's it's not doing it for someone else though, so it's not pro-social. And I guess that's how we were kind of defining our white lies. Um, uh, yeah. You know it. it, it I mean, you could when say that he, he he matters to the community that he's he's a you know a representative of, I suppose. Sure. Um, but I, I, you know, I think he's he's doing it essentially to save himself, mm-hmm. um, and in part because he didn't want those other people who to, to be able to do the wrong thing. I guess you could say he's he's actually in in some respect helping them out to not do something wrong, although mm-hmm. they. They want to do something wrong. <laughs> this is this would be a good one, actually. We could think about other cases too. Like, should you lie to the junkie or the alcoholic who who wants to get to the stuff that's actually in the apartment that you're in? Should you lie and tell them that there isn't any stuff? Um, well, you I say, would say you should. Myself. Yeah. yeah, you could definitely look at that as a pro-social if you're trying to make sure that he's not going to get. <laughs> Uh, fall off the junk and then yeah. over, overdose yeah. he's like that's the idea yeah um so maybe let's move on to like big and little lies because this is also another distinction here that's a how, how do you draw that one that's kind of a hard one like it's most white lies are little lies because they're like you know saving the that 
emotional state or something about okay. a person. But like the big lies are the ones with big consequences. And like this is also we're we're just talking about life and death things, and those are mm-hmm. big consequences. And you know, the bigger the lie, you know, look at um, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq or you know. So it's the it's the content and the consequences that make it big or little. Then right? yes. It's not just like so. I mean, I could I could tell a real whopper, as we say, mm-hmm. about some trivial matter, couldn't I? Like, um, I say that my you know my hangnail is gonna cause me to die tomorrow or something like that. You know, clearly over the top kind of thing. Is that a big lie or is that a little lie? That's a little lie. Okay. <laughs> like it's it's not like the amount of how blatantly false it is it's the 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 consequences of like especially life or death or so so if i tell like <laughs> let's say you're married and i i tell your wife you know some big story about how you've been cheating on her and i like manufacture some text streams or something like that mm-hmm. that's a big lie right because right. that's that's going to get you in a lot of hot water mm-hmm. um and, and cause a great rift um does that mean then that the sort of we were talking about razzing or telling stories that those sort of automatically become small because the consequences to that are kind of small? Yes. In this particular di- like distinction. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that and, makes that, that makes sense to me. And but the, both of them can have bad outcomes. It's just the the magnitude of that bad outcome. Yeah. Um. So, uh, you know, there's. Well, I, know, I, I know you wanted to talk about a lot of the negative consequences uh-huh. to to lying, um, and you you've got quite a few things sort of in reserve here for us to to go right. over. Um, which would you say are the the most important bad consequences? Um, eroding trust. Okay. Um And. Um, self-deception and just generally pulling us away from a more objective world. Okay. And so, if I will, like, the idea is, white lies, like, you're doing them and you're trying to do them to do something that's pro-social. But the problem is that if you are doing all these little white lies that are pro-social, once other people see that you can easily, uh, say these things with like little worry about them and at the drop of the hat yeah um then all of a sudden it makes everything else you say suspect and now you're now eroding the trust that you have with them you know like this what when the it says like oh i can't like meet you up on friday like you know i had to take the car into the uh mechanic it's like is that person <laughs> actually lying to me or not like what is the the basis of their reality and why they're going to say things. I think that you can say that that not only erodes the trust within that relationship, but also in others. So like if you see me, let's say we're sitting at the coffee shop, right? And we're chatting about what we're going to do for the show and like in a phone call. And I, 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 I say something that you know is, is untrue. Like I'm saying, yeah, I'm not at the coffee shop. I'm actually like getting my oil changed. And you look at me, and you're like, what's, what's going on here? Um, and, and afterwards I get off and I say, yeah, I just can't tell them that I was at the coffee shop because they really don't like coffee shops. Um, I needed to tell something. You would actually look at me and be like, well, so that guy tends to make up stories whenever he thinks it's convenient. Mm-hmm. And now you, you could like look at me and be like, well, I don't like him for that reason. But you could also be like, mm, that's not a bad idea. Actually, I should try that sometime <laughs> the next time. You know, and if we think about certain relationships that we have where um, think about teachers and students or um, a boss and, and employees or um, uh you know, parents and children, anything where there's like a power imbalance. When we see the people who are higher up lying routinely, then it seems like it's it, it's okay, right? It normalizes it. Exactly. That's a good way to put it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And um, but the, one of the things is like we have a negative a negativity bias, and so we're much more attuned mm. to those bad things. And it's like you know, someone 
cut you off or like flipped you off or something and you that you dwell on that much more than the good things and there's a an interesting paper by um, Roy F. Baumaster and Ellen Bartslavsky um, which is called Bad is Stronger Than Good and one of the uh, conclusions they did from their research was that there's about a four to one uh, margin of those uh, bad things to good things and so hmm. uh, it once you have a bad impression about someone and you kind of like start to maybe attribute an idea of the bad to them because you see them doing bad things like this example of the the lying it, yeah. it takes so much more to, to overcome that to overcome that now like oh, yeah. you know, four times as much good things to say oh yeah he's actually a pretty good guy even though he lies sometimes or so well that's interesting cuz that that you know there's this like sort of old fashioned view of like your your honor or your truthfulness or your integrity as being this this thing that you can't afford to damage or tarnish and that would that would suggest that there is really something to that right Cause okay then then you you have to like scrub the floors or something for a while until you get back into someone's good graces yeah um and the last thing is like really that uh you know we have only one way to improve ourselves and that is to be really aware of the state that we are in the world the world around us and how we're interacting with it and if we're constantly being given bad information about this um then we have no ability to uh objectively interact with the world and you see this all the time yeah. at um like america's got talent and you see those people that think that they're such amazing singers because all their friends and family have just never had the ability to actually say no you're not good and then they yeah you know, embarrass themselves on national television that is actually a problem um, interestingly enough, talking with people who, who work in the art field and who work in the music field, where uh, because, you know, you, you come up through high school first before you go to like, you know, Berkeley School of Music or Milwaukee Institute of Art and Design. And quite often in high school, you're the proverbial big fish in a small pond. You're the talented artist person. And people are telling you how, how great you are. And then what you're hearing is, oh, I'm so amazing. When you, usually they're saying, oh, you have so much potential. You need to go somewhere and cultivate that potential that you've got. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it'll be so much better for you when you've put in four years of this. And so they, they come in and quite often they're like, I don't need to take a drawing class. I already did drawing back in high school. And they're like, no, you, 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 you know, you really need to learn the techniques properly. And it's the same thing with like people who come in. I've got a friend who's a guitar professor. Professor. And he says, the constant problem with, with these kids coming in who have like made YouTube videos of themselves playing and they're, they're like shredding something. And he's like, okay, you don't know the basic music theory. You've got to actually study this stuff and do these drills. And by the way, you learned how to finger stuff wrong and now you've got to unlearn that, mm -hmm. you know. And so having, having been told things that weren't strictly speaking lies, but which they processed wrong maybe. It, it, now, is that lying to themselves in, in doing that and telling themselves, oh, I'm, I'm much further along than, uh, than they really are? Um, I'm a better musician. I'm a better draftsperson than, than I actually am. Um, that, that certainly impedes them. Is, is, it, is it a case of lying to themselves? Um, in the strict sense, no. Um, but definitely... You know, and, and it might even not be of a strict sense for the people that are telling them that they're good. They might have some really good talent. And yeah. in respect to what they know as musicians, if they're a non-musician, they probably sound really good. But they yeah. don't have the the background to actually make a, a valid assessment of that. And so I guess that kind of goes down to that, that Dunning-Kruger effect that the the less you know about something the more you feel like you are have qualification to do or assess something yeah now i'm going to go off on a little tangent here mm -hmm. um if you if you make a statement about something that you're you're not an expert in and you don't don't really know that much about uh, and it turns out to be false and you 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 could have learned you know otherwise but you didn't put in the time are you telling a lie in that case hmm. how, how authoritatively are you saying this 
That's a good question. Wow. So, so the person who's like, oh man, yeah, you rock. You're so good. <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe they, they're, they're not speaking in any authoritative manner they're just talking like a fan so maybe there's less of an onus there but if i if i go to somebody i mean I, i'm trying to think of something that i'm like totally unqualified to talk about um oh here, you know so i used to skateboard when i was younger and i really enjoyed it but i don't i barely remember any of the terminology and i i don't know how to do any of the the tricks anymore um i have no idea about you know where you would place your weight or foot or anything to do those things. And let's say I, I go in and because skateboarding is clearly quite popular again, and I start, you know, telling, you know, kids about how I used to skate back in the 80s. <laughs> and, you know, those, these are what the boards are like, and you should do this and you should do this and you should do this. Maybe, maybe there I am trying to talk as if I'm authoritative. Mm -hmm. Right. And then, so then is that lying to them? If I'm pretending to an expertise that I don't, I don't have. Yeah, and actually, it's a really good segue to one of my points of Andrew Wakefield, who was the researcher who uh, made that paper that supposedly showed a link between autisms and vaccines, and how oh you know, yeah uh, he had he he was a doctor, but he got stripped of that afterwards, and you know, the research afterwards showed that he was very sloppy in his his methods, and that he should not have made that. Uh, conclusion at all and the problem is that it has been now become like gospel to a certain mm. uh, segment of the population it is a lie that he should have known better uh, because of his uh, apparent schooling and uh, he failed and, he, uh, and the reason why it has so much credence was that at one point in time he was talking in a very authoritative manner yeah. And, you know, something that that brings to mind for me is perhaps the more of the truth, because we never know all of the truth, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Maybe the more of the truth that we have, the greater responsibility we have then to not abuse that that truth in order to, to tell lies. So, so if I've actually like gone to medical school and um, been a practicing physician for a long time, there's a greater onus on me to be truthful about things pertaining to the body and um, <clears throat> drugs and, and medicine than there would be just some person on the street. Or, you know, if you go up to me and you ask me about philosophy and I tell you that, you know, Plato said all sorts of things that he didn't actually say, it's probably worse for me to be doing that than it is for my friend, the guitar professor who studies philosophy on the side as, as an amateur, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. And then one of the other problems about this is that these things have uh, you know, it's anchoring bias. The first things that you hear makes uh, an idea stick more and everything kind of like, mm. oh, if that that's a thing, then everything else has to go. It's kind of like in uh, negotiations and you say, oh, right. you know, uh, you know I, I want like, you know, uh, $35,000 for your annual salary. And they're like, okay, great. You know, we'll, we'll, we'll dicker <laughs> around and, you know, we'll stay around there instead of you saying 45. And they're like, oh, now they have to actually, you know, uh, negotiate or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you kind of a funny story. I so you know my my first job out of um, out of uh, graduate school was teaching in a maximum security prison, and I was just offered the salary that I was offered, and there wasn't any negotiation or anything like that. And it wasn't it wasn't an awful lot of money. It was like thirty five thousand five hundred per year. And then um, you could get like merit raises provided you were like publishing and stuff like that. But the merit raises were not not very much. And then the prison education program that I was teaching in got phased out by by the state of Indiana. And there's a whole long story to be told about that that I'm not going to go into here. Um, and so I had to get on the job market. And one of the places that I, I not only got an interview at, but then got a job offer at was Fayetteville State University. And um, this time I thought, and I didn't really have any good advice on this from you know mentors by that time, but I thought, well, I'm going to negotiate this time. And so they offered me 50000 and I was like, nah, that's too low. And then they, they were like, well... Um, what would you take? And I was, and I, I, I probably could have driven them up higher, but I didn't know well enough. And I said, 55. And they're like, okay, you've got it. <laughs> and then, you know, because all of this is public record, you could, you could, 
look and see everybody who, who was earning everything in the North Carolina system. And I realized that I'd lowballed myself. But I also realized that my colleague who came in at the exact same time as me and had two additional years of teaching experience had also lowballed herself $1,000 less. And once, once it was fixed, it was, you, you couldn't get it changed. Because as soon as we came in, it was 2008. And within three months of getting there, um, the, you know, the economic crisis had worsened and all salaries were frozen and no travel and all this other stuff. But, it, it, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, you, you know, when you, when you do negotiate, quite often you have to negotiate without having any clue of what you're doing. <laughs> You know, and and there you know you're not going to get straight information out of the people that you're negotiating with either. Some people have actually uh, proposed having agents for everyone. Agents. Yeah, to negotiate on work? your behalf. Yeah, oh, just interesting. Like, you know, they actually know how one to negotiate and two how much your skills are worth. And okay. So they just you know they get a small cut and they just like heck he's just like i'm the the professor guy agent and I, i've got all the the professors on my uh, at yeah. my company and you know i'll get the best for you i know what i can get for you so uh, they would be sort of like a like a combination of a headhunter and an agent right they they'd connect you up with the uh the jobs and potentially it could just be that's kind of know. an attractive idea actually so actually let's <clears throat> talk about uh deontological and consequentialist uh lying Okay, yeah, and I, I don't think we'll be able to get into too much other moral theory, but this is where one of the big division lines runs. So, and we can we can place like Immanuel Kant in one corner because he's the one who everyone goes to, and then Jeremy Bentham and John Stuart Mill is the utilitarians in the other. And and the sort of standard line is that Kant thinks you should never ever 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 lie. There's no exceptions. Um, you know, it's, it's always a terrible thing when, when you lie. As a matter of fact, in, in the, the groundwork for the metaphysics of morals, he gives you this whole, you know, discussion of it, that, that lying is even in some respect nonsensical. You can't possibly will it as a, a universal, what he calls a universal law of nature, that we should lie when it's convenient or anything like that, because it would undermine the very notion of truth and falsity if everyone were to do it so this is pretty dramatic stuff right right and then and then in the um, actual metaphysics of morals he goes a little bit further and he says that lying is the worst thing that a person can essentially do in relation to themselves it's the greatest violation of a person's duty to themselves and he talks about lying internally and externally. And this goes to the thing that you were talking about a little bit earlier. Lying externally is lying to other people, lying to the world. Lying internally is lying to yourself. And lying internally is worse than lying externally. Not that they're not both terrible, mm-hmm. but they're, <clears throat> they're really bad. And he goes so far as to say that even having a good motive or an innocuous motive, like he gives the example of levity, that doesn't excuse it. So that's, that's you know, a very strong deontological, meaning duty-based uh, point of view. There are other deontologists like W.D. Ross um, and Robert Audi in the present who would say that there, there could be some circumstances where you do need to lie, where, where it could be a duty, but then you would have to find some way to try to fix the, the damage afterwards. So for an internal lie by yeah. way of Kant, is that a self-deception or... Um, just the idea that I would say a lie, and so I know that I'm telling a lie. So that's a good question. It is self-deception, but in a lot of cases, it's not really effective self-deception. So, and it could tie in with the, the telling a lie to somebody else. So if you think about why we lie to other people, um, maybe I lie to you and I tell myself that it's really a white lie to save your feelings, but the, the truth of the matter is I just don't want you to have access to that information or I'm worried about the consequences of the truth coming to light or something like that. So I do lie to myself, right? That, that's the internal lie. And we can lie to ourselves without involving other people as well. We can tell ourselves that we're, oh, you mentioned the Dunning-Kruger effect. I mean, people who 
who are in the bottom quartile, right, mm-hmm. are lying to themselves all the time saying, I'm so attractive, I'm so brilliant, I'm so this, I'm so that. Um, and, and those would be, now the question is, is the person deliberately doing it or is it just sort of like an automatic process? Mm-hmm. Um, are they doing it to try to support their self-esteem? Um, and Kant would say, all, listen, all of those things are really damaging to the, to the person within you. Um, and somebody else who we were talking about before this, um, you know, Epictetus the Stoic, I think he would, he would probably go along with Kant on that. You know, we, when we lie to ourselves, we're really doing something bad for ourselves. You know, and, and it's, it's interesting if you think about this, because that would rule out quite a few practices that people sometimes do to try to motivate themselves or... Like pump themselves up in the mirror or something? Yeah. Yeah, which might which might be helpful for accomplishing things, mm-hmm. you know. Uh, now, on the other hand, we have the utilitarians, and the utilitarians focus on consequences, and so they want to see they're not you know um, looking at just their own consequences or their own in group. They're looking at everybody and how they're affected, and so they say that the right thing to do is whatever is going to promote the general happiness, meaning, uh, you know, produce the most positive outcomes and the least negative outcomes. So, you know, I think we can think of a lot of cases where people tell lies and the justification for that will be, well, I want to prevent this thing from happening over here, which would be bad. And, uh, you know, in general, the utilitarians are pretty comfortable with telling lies. As a matter of fact, John Stuart Mill in On Liberty um, is perfectly fine with, with people um, telling lies in what we can call the marketplace of ideas, you know, saying things that are false because, you know, ultimately the truth should, should come out of it. Um, mm-hmm. I think he's a little optimistic about that, but, <laughs> you know. Um, but they, they, they don't say it's just because any case of lying to a person would produce positive outcomes that it's okay. They do worry a bit about... Um, your motivations and um, dispositions that you're developing over time, you know. So being stuck in a situation where you'd have to lie constantly would probably be bad for you. I think, do we have a moment to talk about the nature of truth? Well, I think we should, if we do want to consider our question and our practice, I think we have to jump into those. Yeah. so we got a question, which is, I've always been one to think that a person should stay true to their experience when telling a story. If you have to go out of your way to exaggerate or lie about parts of the story, then the story clearly wasn't interesting enough to tell. So in a recent instance, when my girlfriend was telling a story, it made me cringe when she felt the need to lie about details to make it more interesting. I confronted her about this alone, in private, sharing my thoughts as above. She did not take it well and is mad, and in truth, I feel that she is actually the one at fault for, in my eyes, essentially lying. So these are two people who probably aren't going to do well together over the long term, I'm guessing, right? But but how should we how should we look at this? Is this person in the right to be um, calling calling his significant other out for yeah. embellishing stories? Is this a, what, what do you think? It definitely seems to be a um, a difference in opinion about what is right to do in these situations, and there's a uh, a mismatch in the modulation about like what is good enough to say or not. Um, I guess the the thing that is not quite clear about this um, was that is the, the girlfriend expecting the other people to believe the things that she's saying, That's or a good she distinction, yeah. or she expecting them yeah. to think it is actually like you know a, a tall tale. Yeah. Now, why would that make a difference? It's the, the intended um, deception. You know, yeah. you're, you're trying to either modulate reality or you're trying to uh, entertain. It's the yeah. goal there. Yeah, and I think a lot of people do tell stories 
in the second way that you're talking about where they 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 know that everybody's not going to buy into it and think that this this really is the way that things happened you know historically or however else we want to put it but it makes for it makes for a good story and i mean is there some positive good in having a good story that people can share and laugh about and you know gather around i mean so long as they're not actually relying upon it as a guide to life or what they ought to do um well, maybe maybe there's really no problem with that let's see we have the film and tv industry for a reason yeah now, although people I'm... use those to rely and like give them an idea of how to deal with the world all the time and i think that might is is a miscalculation by the viewer yeah, that's that that's true. I mean, that's that's where we get into some really interesting and murky areas because we can say, well, what what about like, you know, young people who are in an incredibly media saturated environment and are getting all sorts of crazy ideas from the various media that we we constantly bombard them with. Um, a lot of those are are lies in one sense or another, um, if they take those on and think that those really are truthful, um, is it their fault? That, I mean, is there a certain point where, where somebody should, where you could actually say to somebody, hey, you know, you know that's not real. Don't follow that. Um, and where we could say, well, you know, you you ought to have enough common sense to, to know that these stories aren't, aren't uh, veridical. You know? That reminds me of like, the trope of a lot of maybe it's more in the nineties um, sitcoms of like the, someone lies to another person on the story, oh. but it's, they're doing yeah. it in order for them to do something really good or something. And yeah. so they're doing these, these white lies. And at the end it was like, at the, they cause this incredible mishap and like, you know, cars are destroyed or whatever. And they're like, but I was doing it for the best. And everyone's like, Oh, yeah. and it's like that's they've not had to how... tell lie after lie after lie, right? Yeah, so... <clears throat> and yeah. and if you see that over and over and over and over again, you know, just the the repeat repetition of it makes you think that it's true. Like you just get repeated the same. Like oh, that's how things happen. Like people it's sort of always... like a, a a meta lie, then, right? It's it's a lie about lo- truth and lying, right? Yeah. Oh. So. I'm I'm kind of sympathetic to people who embellish. Although, like I was saying, I in in the past I I was much less uh, happy about that. Um, but I think we do have to be careful mm-hmm. about who who is going to take it in. So you wouldn't say some crazy story in front of some perfectly credulous person, perhaps. Right. Uh, so yeah, because. Yeah, that could result in really negative ends if they take that true and that's a, a guide for how to deal with a situation similar to that in the future. Yeah. So we should talk about a practice that can be useful for, for people before we wrap up. Yeah, so what do you got for us? So, I, you know, I, I think that self-examination is really central to um, most moral traditions and, you know, you can do this in a structured way, like at the end of the day or, um, you know, when you get into a difficult situation, some people do it through journaling. And I, I think that you could do this by thematizing truth and lying. You could, you could ask yourself if you've really been honest over some time period or you've really been honest in this exchange. And you can also ask yourself how honest you've been. You know, how, how much did you bend the truth about the things that you've, you've said or other ways in which you may have communicated as well? So you can, you can think about this in a couple different ways. One thing that you can focus on is to think about whether other people actually were deceived and whether that was your intent to do that. And then you can think about ways in which other people not necessarily automatically were deceived, but could have been deceived, where things could have gone off the rails where you you said something you know another thing that happens in sitcoms just to go back to that is one person says something and the other person misunderstands it a little bit and then they don't correct that misunderstanding and then they take advantage of that misunderstanding i think that's a way of of engaging in deception and lying and then the other thing that i think is important is to 
um, you know, step back from it. And, you, you know, while you're being brutally honest with yourself, which may be quite difficult, you have to ask yourself, okay, why do I lie? Mm-hmm. What, what's going on with me that, that motivates me to say things that aren't true? And I know that they're not true. And I want the other person to believe them as being true. Um, and there could be a wide variety of, of motives, right? It could be um, monetary. It could be saving one's own face. It could be motivated by some good. It could be because you want people to like you. That's a really common example, I think. People tell lies all the time to try to get other people to, to either like them or not dislike them. And so figuring out what makes you tick is quite important. And so by, by carrying out this almost like inventory and self-examination, you can get a handle on it and you can develop some greater awareness that allows you then to start making decisions and intervening and hopefully steering yourself <laughs> towards being a bit more truthful uh, because truth is something you know that, that we value. Um, and, and so I, I think that could be a useful practice. I don't actually have a name for the practice other than maybe you know, being honest with yourself about lying. <laughs> right. Uh, this kind of reminds me because at one point in time of my life, I, I did kind of like a little pseudo gaslighty thing where I like to just move small objects around a room when no one else was in the room. <laughs> and like, okay. and so like, the whole idea was like I was never going to try to like steal anything or make people like totally misplace it. it was just like, oh, it's it's on that table instead of that table. Yeah. Um, and I just like I got a kick out of it. It was like this enjoy to see them be just confused for a moment, um, and then they'd find it. And and it was like this little internal thing that I thought I was like, oh, that's that's perfectly fine. That's not actually hurting anyone. Um, and I'm getting a little bit of you know endorphins or joy out of it. And, yeah. And then you know w- one day someone saw me do it and and pointed it out, and all of a sudden you get that like that shame and i kind of yeah. think of um oh start talking about like um looking through, through the keyhole exactly looking through yeah, the yeah. keyhole and <laughs> and now you see yourself as the object of someone else's derision and you're like oh yeah. shoot that is that is exactly how i i'm being seen and now i i need to reflect upon that and sometimes it just takes you that extra experience to be able to reflect yeah, being caught in a lie yeah. is is an unpleasant experience, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's a, that's a great example, I think, of uh, how a very minor thing can can turn into something that um, it, it didn't have any terrible consequences, but but it certainly felt like something like that for you. Well, we should we should wrap up. Any any final thoughts about uh, lies? Do you want to tell any or? <laughs> <laughs> um, so we got a quote and so we'll leave you the words of C.H. Spurgeon and um, a lie will go around the world while the truth is pulling its boots on which is famously misattributed to Mark Twain <laughs> so we're ending on a lie you know, right, right? <laughs> or we're trying to bring truth to a lie so thank you all 